Hey guys, welcome back. Professor Tomney here from Chem Complete. This is going to be the practice session for the substitution reactions that we just went through. So if you're looking for practice problems for SN1 and SN2, you're in the right place. If you have not gone through those lessons, I would encourage you to watch them first or at least make sure you've gone through this information in your class or textbook. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the questions. We're going to have some that are mechanism questions and then some that are theoretical questions to answer. So let's bring this up here. These are the first three questions and we are going to go through these. Let me enlarge this a little bit. We are going to go through these together on the whiteboard. <clears throat> so for substitution practice, number one, draw a basic energy diagram for both SN2 and SN1 reactions. Very basic. You do not need details for that. Um, we'll go through that one. List at least three ways that an SN1 and an SN2 reaction are going to differ from one another. And then suppose that you wish to turn a primary alkyl halide, so a primary halogen, into a primary alcohol using a substitution reaction. List one way besides heating, and I'm also going to throw this in because a lot of students always like to say this, besides heating and a catalyst that you could use to increase the rate of the reaction. Be specific. So in other words, think about what type of reaction is this, SN1 or SN2, and how could you potentially increase the rate of the SN1 or the SN2 reaction uh, based on that information. <clears throat> so go ahead and give your best shot at these three questions. I'm going to encourage you to pause the video, work through this by yourself, and then you can unpause it and we will go through these together. So go ahead and give these a shot. All right, welcome back. Hopefully everybody had a chance to work on these. So I am going to set these aside here. Let's minimize this a little bit. Uh, we will reference it, but we are going to bring up the whiteboard and work on that. So number one, draw basic energy diagrams for an SN2 and an SN1 reaction. For an SN2, the key in terms of knowing what to draw here is that you have to understand an SN2 is going to have a one-step mechanism with no intermediates. So we'll just put an E here to represent energy, right? And down here we have the reaction coordinates. Anytime you see RXN, that stands for reaction. So here's the reaction coordinates. And if I were to do a basic SN2, I would have my reactants they would reach some transition state and then they would come down and form products. It's really just that simple. There's nothing else to this because again, this all occurs in one step. Now, the SN1 reaction, if you were to draw this energy diagram, okay, and if you got that wrong for the SN2, I would encourage you to pause this before you watch this, see if you can do the SN1. But for the SN1, same thing, we'll label the energy. We'll label the reaction coordinates down here. And now the key here is that I will start with reactants and hit a transition state, but I stop and come down at an intermediate, right? I then continue on. Now, some of you may have done one extra transition state and come down to the products, but in reality, there would be two additional before you come down here, okay? And that is because the first intermediate is going to be the carbocation intermediate. But once the nucleophile comes in, we normally have a neutral nucleophile, okay? And so this second dip right here, this intermediate, is the nucleophile in a positively charged form. It has to be deprotonated, right? So in other words, what I'm talking about is, let's say that I have this carbocation here, and the water comes in, the water comes in like this. It's not an alcohol, it's water. And this is another intermediate that you would find right here. So another water, another H2O, needs to come in, remove one of these protons in order to get the alcohol or the final product at the resting spot, okay? So as long as you have two of these, I would say you're in pretty good shape. If you came up with all three, the fact you needed three transition states, one, two, three, before you got to your product, and two intermediates, right, the carbocation, 
and the positively charged nucleophile after it's come in, then you're in pretty good shape for that. Okay, the SN2 should be the easier of the, the two choices. All right, so that takes care of that one. List at least three ways in which an SN1 and an SN2 are going to differ. Okay, there are really four potential, and you, if you're creative, you might be able to come up with even more than that, but there's four major things we could talk about. So the first one that I hope most people can identify is the position of the leaving group. Now, you have to be specific when you're saying this. It's not the identity of the leaving group. Remember, tosylates work best for SN1 and SN2, then iodine, and so on and so forth. But in other words, for SN2, we really prefer the methyl and then the primary right and then the secondary i'm not going to write all these out including vanillic allylic and things like that i'm just going to use these major ones here and then the tertiary right this one's shut down due to sterics and then we see the opposite effect when we do sn1 so if we want sn1 we would say okay now i'm dealing with electronics because of carbocations tertiary carbocations are best followed by secondary primaries don't really hold much of a chance and methyls would be non-existent and this is because of i'm going to abbreviate here but this is because of the electronic argument right the hyperconjugation and the inductive effects of those carbocations that are present so that's one that's probably most important one that i would hope you would realize second one is solvent right so our solvent we picked out different solvents and you could have this in any order the order doesn't matter uh, sn2 we need the polar aprotic, right? We want to make sure that that nucleophile has enough energy to get in and attack as the leaving group is leaving. In the SN1, we would prefer the polar protic because we would like those protic hydrogen bonds to help stabilize the carbocation that forms. So we have difference in the solvent, the nucleophile, Okay, and for the nucleophile, in an SN2, the nucleophile that we prefer would be strong and have a negative charged, whereas for an SN1, we would prefer one that is mild okay, and neutral. So we're not looking for any type of charged nucleophile when we get to SN1. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat. All right, uh, for number four, when we get to number four, the last one, and probably the one that may trick people the most because they tend to forget about it, uh, it's not really a condition of the reactants as much as an outcome, and that's the stereochemistry. Right, and so for the stereochem, the SN2 is going to do 100% inversion, whereas the SN1 is going to have 50% inversion and 50% retention of the stereochemistry. That's a T there. Okay? So that takes care of at least four possibilities like i said if you got creative you might be able to come up with other things you know some people might say carbocations are present in sn1 where carbocations are not present in sn2 that's really simply restating some of this knowledge the position of the leaving groups is directly related to the fact that there's carbocations the fact that we get 50 percent inversion and 50 percent retention in sn1 deals with the fact that there's a carbocation the trigonal planar attack okay um, but as long as you're coming up with three solid answers, you're you're in pretty good shape for that. Okay. All right. Number three. Suppose you wish to turn a primary alkyl halide. So let's come up with a primary. Remember, just CH3 would be methyl. So we'll add a CH2 on there. We'll make this an iodine. That's the best alkyl halide we could pick out. And we wish to turn it into an alcohol right? A primary alcohol. So I'm going to substitute an OH here. The key is, is this going to be SN1 or SN2, right? And you hopefully should realize because this is a primary leaving group, we're dealing with SN2, right? We cannot have primary carbocations forming to any great extent. And so we would much more 
uh, we, we would prefer to definitely select a SN2 over an SN1 in this case. So that means I'll take a charged nucleophile instead of a neutral one. We'll go ahead with minus OH. Remember, this might be written out as something like NaOH, right? And then I need a solvent. So let's go ahead. I'll pick out DMF. That's one of the polar aprotic solvents. But again, key here being that I need aprotic for this reaction. And then I could get CH3, CH2, OH, right? So the question is, how could I potentially get an alcohol? So I can't change the nucleophile itself. I still need the alcohol. But how could I get the alcohol and increase the kinetics of this reaction, right? Well, if this was something like a bromide or a chloride, I could bump up to an iodide because that's a better leaving group. But it's already at an iodide. So I could potentially increase this to a tosylate, right? I could make this a tosylate leaving group. If I do that, that will increase the ability of the leaving group and therefore the kinetics of the reaction. So one thing that you could do is change. And when I say change, make sure that you upgrade, you don't downgrade, your leaving group. Okay, now I know I mentioned heat in the, in the answer, and that's because most students... I'll just say it's kind of a cop out to say heat the reaction or add a catalyst. That's the go-to. That's the very, very gen chemish answer. Considering we're in orgo at this point, we want to be looking in the reference specific to SN1 or SN2 reactions, how we could improve this. So the other one is to pick a better aprotic solvent. All right, now we didn't necessarily rank these solvents. They do have rankings. You can find them in a textbook. DMF is a pretty good aprotic solvent, but something like, like HMPA is better. And so I could pick out a better aprotic solvent. Now keep in mind, this is DMF is still aprotic, okay? It's not that I picked out a polar protic and I could improve it by picking out a polar aprotic. These are both aprotic. However, this is a better aprotic solvent uh, than the DMF is. And so I could pick a better aprotic solvent or I could upgrade my leaving group. This is probably the uh, the more common of the two in terms of what students usually answer. But both of these would be acceptable choices. Okay. All right. Clear that off. Now the other thing I'm going to bring up here. So we're done with those. Okay. I have some practice problems. And no, we don't need to save the blank sheet. And so here are the practice problems. Let me enlarge this for us. Okay. I know it's a little bit small here, but what we are working with, let me see if I can zoom in some. Here is a primary alkyl bromide, and we're using NASH with DMSO, okay, as the solvent to get this thiol, this SH group over here. And then we're doing a similar type reaction where we're creating a thiol again. So take a minute, draw these out, and then once you've drawn them out, you should try to work through the mechanisms. So pause the video, and then we'll come back and we'll work through that. All right, guys, welcome back. Hopefully you were able to get through this. So let's talk about this. First, I want to determine if these are SN1 or SN2, because that's going to affect the mechanism. So let's look at what I have here. I have a primary leaving group, right? I have a charged, because remember, when I have the Na, it's going to dissociate and give me a negative charged nucleophile. So I have a strong negatively charged nucleophile. And I have DMSO, which is a polar aprotic solvent. So all three of these align to an SN2 reaction. Down here, I've got a tertiary leaving group. Notice this methyl up here counts because it is on the carbon that contains the halogen. And so I have a tertiary leaving group. We already know that can't be SN2, but let's see if the other stuff supports. So I have a nucleophile that is mild and considered neutral. It's not charged. And then I have H2O as the solvent, which is protic, right? And so if I have a polar protic solvent, a mild neutral nucleophile, and a tertiary leaving group, all of this is pointing to an SN1 type reaction. So let's do the easier of the two first. I'm going to have 
SH and that will have a minus charge, right? The bromine is going to leave and as the bromine leaves, the nucleophile is going to come in and perform a backside attack on the carbon that contained the leaving group. And I end up here. That's all there is to an SN2, okay? Just that one step. Now here, this is going to be a little more complicated. In an SN1, the leaving group needs to leave first, right? So the bromine needs to leave. Once the bromine has left, I am left with a carbocation in this tertiary position right here. After that, I have water as the solvent and I have sulfur as the nucleophile, the thiol. Now keep in mind, of these two, which is the better nucleophile? Because they could both technically come in and try to attack. And the answer is the sulfur group is better because it's lower on the periodic table in terms of the column. And so therefore its valence electrons are not as tightly bound and they're more open for attacking and bonding. And so I would have an attack of my carbocation. This would then create the following. Okay, Depends on if I come in from the front or the back. Technically there would be another product here. So hopefully you realize that I could also have, because I could come in from the front or the back with my nucleophile, I could have CH3 out in front and I could have the SH in back. But we're just going to show the mechanism where the SH is out front. So if the SH attacks from the front, then I'll go ahead and get SH. Remember that this comes as a whole group, right? So there's a plus charge on that sulfur. The methyl group is back here. And then I can get water to come in and grab a proton. And that'll give the electrons back to the sulfur. And therefore, I would be set with my reaction right there. Okay, so that would be the mechanism of that one. Again, you would get a mixture of these. I'm only showing one of the two in my mechanism, but you could also get at this step, the SH is dashed back and the methyl is wedged in front. That could certainly happen as well. So I hope you guys found this problem solving session informative and helpful. If you have any additional questions, leave them in the comments section. I'll be happy to respond. Please like the video if you found it useful so that I can gather some feedback. And remember to subscribe as always. And I appreciate uh, your continued support. And I will see you guys for the next set of lectures. Take care.